Very welcome to Mark Somerville. Hi, Mark. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Mark is a managing director at Persico Marine, uh, but uh, I think uh, we can say that Marco, Mark is a, a big personage in sailing world because uh, you made something like nine participation in America's Cup. It's right? Yeah, I think it's something like that. It's nine or ten, or you're probably counting. <laughs> nine or ten. Yeah. More than 20 years involved in the America's Cup. How many America's Cup you won? Uh, two, I think, so far. Oh, not, not bad, not so bad. Not so and then bad. you make also, you are involved also in six uh, wheat bread around the world race, Volvo Ocean Race, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the but, cup game goes back to the early 90s and similar to the, well, we started with the whip bread many, many years ago. Yeah, yeah but, but, but in my point of view, one of the most important things is that you born in Auckland, New Zealand, that is something like uh, the very center of sailing world in the planet. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the New Zealand is, and this is the point of the first question, New Zealand is the country where the concept of AC-75 boats is born. And I would like uh, to, to ask you, Mark, uh, um, if you can tell us something about the story, the born of a new concept, this a revolutionary concept in sailing world, how the, the AC-75 was born, what the, the key person in this story, who invented the, for the first time uh, these foil arms uh, moving uh, and so on, and the transition from design, the paper, and the implementation, the realization. Uh, and, and at last, what is the, the role of Persico Marine in this story? Many questions. Yeah, I'd love <laughs> to answer all those, uh, Fabio. It's, it's quite a nice story, that one, actually. I think, um, you know, it goes quite far back when we started putting boats on foils and uh, started making boats fly, uh, essentially. And, um, you know, we all know that the initial rule of the AC-72 was actually not to fly, but the development, and, and at that stage we were working with Lunarosa. We were fortunate enough to, to work with them then, and we were working to develop the SL-33 in smaller boats to see if we could get the smaller boats to fly, and that eventually ended up being the development leading into the AC-72 actually foiling. Um, which we knew we saw Team New Zealand were probably the first to actually make the make the boat for the big boat anyway, and everyone sort of followed suit. And then since then we've seen you know lots of classes and lots of boats flying. Um, the AC you know AC 45s ended up being AC 45 Fs and foiling, and that led into the 50s. And, um, and that sort of paved the way and developed a lot of the technology of the hydrofoil, you know, the shapes of the foils and the systems, which obviously are fundamentally part of, you know, how these boats and why these boats can sail today the way they do is, is not just um, the shape of these foils, but also the systems behind it and the development of that has been incredibly steep over the last few years. Um, and, 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 and quite rightly so, you know, every America's Cup, there's big turns and changes and big tax and jobs. And, uh, and here we are today, you know, coming out of the catamarans. And um, I think it goes back to Lunarosa and Vitelli himself wanting, uh, wanting to go back to a monohull. And, uh, and some, some of the brainchilds in Team New Zealand um, sat down and came up with you know how to make a monohull actually fly and that's what we have today which is you know an incredible challenge um and you know i I'd, i know quite a few of those people um that are involved you know a very good friend of mine is, um is guillaume verdier who is you know is well known to be you know the guy and the the crazy scientist behind the ac-75 and a lot of the other developments over the last you know, many, many years. And um, I think that this stems predominantly from, from him. And I'm sure, obviously, there's a bigger team behind it. But um, there are very special people involved, these guys. Um, yeah, so that I think that's where it starts from. And that's where we were headed. Um, it definitely was a challenge. I think there's been a lot of people, including me, that, you yeah. know, you look at it and think, you know, is it actually going to be viable? Um, 
I always had a lot of faith in it, faith in it. Um, I thought um, if Guillaume's behind it, you know, we've got a pretty good chance to pull it off. Um, and, you know, the technology today with, you know, like I said before, really, what gave us a lot of, or gave me anyway, the, the confidence behind it all is, you know, where we came from. Um, and that was, you know, the evolution of, of I, let's just say, foiling of today, which meant that the systems behind the foiling itself, you know, all the electronic systems and so forth and sensors and, you know, gyro compasses and that it's in the boats today to make these things uh, fly safely and stable is there. Um, alongside that, the development of the foils, meaning, um, you know, foils today are all made out of carbon fibre, so they're packed heavily with a very, very strong material, you know, they're one of the strongest merit materials today. That can be not just strong, but also stiff and stable. Um, the development of that over the, the last 10 years is, has also improved dramatically. So combine yeah. all those things with the computational power that, you know, computers have today as, you know, compared to what they were 20 years ago, and you combine all of those, then, you know, you, you end up in a position where you can be pretty confident with where you're going. And, um, and, and you can see that today. You know, we started with it on paper, uh, and now we see the boats you know, uh, flying around, you know, like racing machines as they as they should be. And the development is, you know, we've seen with them, you know, going in the water with mules to the first boats going in the water that are, were very different to each other. Everyone had their own ideas. Right. You know, fundamentally, the of course, the, the system of the arm and, and the arm itself, which we provided everybody, was all the same. And then everyone was playing with hull shapes and aerodynamics and the actual wings themselves. And uh, the development of, you know, from boat one to boat two and where we are today, a relatively, in a really, really short time frame. Um, these boats are now still very different to each other, but I must say that I'm, you know, really happy to see that, you know, we can put races together on the water with these boats and still have them, you know, seconds apart, which is phenomenal, absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, I think the same. It's, it's incredible. Considering the short time, you said, the short time between bot one and bot two, the, the development was absolutely astonishing. And, and uh, it's uh, uh, unavoidable to ask uh, uh, ourselves uh, how the future of AC-75 bots <laughs> Where, where they where how much is the speed they can reach in the future because uh, once uh, we talk about 40 knots then someone talk about 50 knots now we reach at 53 knots in the future cap the 37th cap <laughs> if the ac75 remain the class for the cap which speed they can reach good question uh I th you know i think the, 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 they'll just keep developing, of course, like anything else and like any other class. And I think these boats and a lot of the technologies within it, you know, they're relatively new. And, um, and you know, we're pioneering the way for the future. But I think speed-wise, Fabio, I'd, you, know, you know, everyone's talking about 10% differences, you know, now um, that Luna Rosa has, you know, put on the table in the boat. And I think that's a bit far-fetched. I don't think it's quite 10%. But... You know, I think in the next America's Cup, you know, we could quite quite easily perceive to see another 10 knots, you know. I think that would be a, a pretty fair, pretty <laughs> fair, pretty fair call at this stage, yeah. 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 But that's pretty quick, though. You know, it starts Absolutely. to get difficult with the four shapes and things, but I think we can get there. Uh, sailing speaking, you know, um, it's often uh, noticed that uh, watching a cup race on TV, uh, people uh, not immediately understand if the boats are sailing upwind or downwind because the sail are always in. <laughs> no? And uh, right. and you said you said uh, uh, once I read uh, you you uh, your interview you say that uh, with foils the speed of boat increased about forty percent foil and non foil, and that the way of sailing has changed. Uh, once we think about the BMG, now we think of the apparent wind. Uh, could you explain how, how sailing as a sport is changing uh, uh, with foil? 
Yeah, I think it's probably even more dramatic than uh, than what I probably said a, a long, long time ago. You know, now we're doing three to four times the speed of the wind. So that's a dramatic change to what it was. You know, years ago, um, you know, we had the version five boats in the America's Cup, which were around for 10 years, actually. And we, I think we built more than 100 boats in total of those. Um, and the changes are not so dramatic. But I think once you pop these boats out of the water and, and foil, then... And uh, we're changing the game completely. Um, yeah, VMG still VMG. Um, to answer that one, I think it's still really, really important. But it is difficult to understand whether you're going upwind or downwind uh, with the apparent wind. And, you know, we saw in the Christmas Cup how I think it also changes things of where you're sailing. You know, and, and I, for one, you know, coming from Auckland, and my son, uh, Marcus Somerville, you know, he's one of the, the 49er sailors out of Auckland there and, and sailing in those same waters there uh, off uh, Takapuna Beach between the beaches on the eastern side and the islands. It gets really patchy and you can see um, in, the, in the last you know, round robins and the last races, it wasn't necessarily about um, worrying about where the other guy was, but it was almost more important to make sure that you're sailing in the pressure and uh, it's really patchy and you have these pressure lines and it's trying to get in phase with where the pressure line is and jumping from patch to patch to to try and maintain as you know as much speed as possible it's sort of focusing on on uh jumping to those patches and keeping the maximum speed and velocity at, at all times but uh and that's where you saw that fantastic race between Luna Rosa and Ineos and I think there was like nine lead changes or something like that. Yeah. In the end, yeah. which was which was spectacular, and and that was that's a boat race right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with Persico Marine, you are involved in many type. You you are a boat builder, so you are involved in many time of foil foiling boat because you you um, build the foil arms for AC seventy five. You build two Luna Rossa boat. You build also many Imoca. 60 with foiling for the Van, Van de Globe. That's and right. You, you also build the, the Persico 69F that is a, a, something like a, a, a dinghy with foil. Uh, w- what is the difference between this? Uh, so, sometimes the differences are very big, no? Between this uh, kind of foils. How do you manage the, the, the approach as a, build bo- as a, a boat builder of this different foil? Yeah, even, um, you know, even going back before foils, we still make foils, you know, even like a dagger board has a foil shape and, you know, Volvo 65s, I, 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 I even don't remember now, there's something like 30, 30 of those foils or dagger boards we built and you know, it doesn't matter how small they are or big they are, they're, they're all just as important as each other. There's, um, there is variations, as you, as you know. Um, and that depending on the shapes and the forms and the weights, and that kind of depicts how we're going to build it. So all the many different foils have different technologies, and that also has been you know a long road for us to follow, which has been you know fantastic really. And this this actually goes for us way back to um, you know ten to eleven years ago, and in, um, in the development of how we used to build foils. 10 years ago, even for the AC-72s, the SL-33s, how we used to build foils then, we don't build them like that anymore. You know, everything's moved on and developed so much. So we're using slightly different materials, different modulus, different weight materials. Um, You know, some processes are inside autoclaves in the pressure vessels. Some we use in presses. Um... Some we're actually laminating directly on tooling, you know, so in plain lamination. Some we're not, like with the AC-75s, we built <coughs> big thick carbon fiber plates and machined them. Um, and then we stacked them up, bonded them all together. We then CT scanned it like an MRI, like you do with a human, to try to understand and check the quality control between all the plates to make sure that we don't have any voids, so no imperfections. Then we machined again in our um, CNC milling machines. Um, and then we, we finally wrapped them, machined them again. So there was a lot of automation and a, a lot of uh, very high-tech processes that went into the AC-75s. But along that road, we we're also you know, involved in a lot of quality control steps from the beginning to the end to make sure that 
you know, every foil was not only the same, but there was, you know, the imperfections were a very, very small and minute. So it didn't, didn't play a part or affect anyone's foil. Um, so I think this, the development of manufacturing foils, uh, at least for us, goes to, you know, 10 to 12 years ago. Um, so we're very comfortable now with, with what we build. We're very comfortable um, with different types of foils, you know, no matter whether it's a, a Persco 69F or we're building foils for AC75s or the Ultim 100 trimorans that you, we see, you know, crossing oceans. They, they all have a very specific process and steps um, that's been refined over many, many years. Big challenge, and I, I think uh, uh, there are not many boat builders, not, not many brands in the world uh, like Persico doing something like that, that you are doing with this special business in sailing. Uh, back, back to the, the IC75, the, probably the most crucial part is the foil arms. The foil arms is the one design part that you at Persico uh, realize for every team in this uh, 36 Americas Cup. And it was a process very difficult. We saw uh, the test, uh, we saw the explosion of the first uh, uh, foil arms. Uh, yeah. have you, uh, uh, can you tell the story of the build and the, and the construction? And <laughs> the special question is if you any time ever, uh, uh, ever been afraid that the concept was too advanced to and, and could not be implemented at the last. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good one. Yeah, well, obviously we were really lucky and fortunate early on to be chosen to do this job. You know, um, maybe because we had the credentials, but it's maybe easier to see that from the outside. So, you know, working with Luna Rosa and the Challenger Record, um, you know, who essentially you know, wrote the rule book and decided that the arm would be a, a one design part and that would all then be one supplier. Um, you know, we were, let's say, fortunate, lucky, but it was a huge challenge, Fabio. It really, really was. Um, you know, we weren't just building one foil for like one Amoka boat or was anything like that. This is a four, you know, more than a 400 kilo foil arm not only did you have to build it, but you had to reproduce that same manufacturing over and over again um, in a certain time frame. And, and that yeah. was, you know, for us, that was the challenge. It was not about building a foil. It was about building a one design part with all of its acceptance criteria and high quality that's perceived and required to take the loads of an AC-75, to do that in a certain time frame with a precision and process to get and give the confidence with all of the America's Cup teams. Now that's, you know, that's not easy. And no. it's, not, it's not about just the teams, but you've got to convince all of the engineers that, you know, they're the best in the world today. And, um, and all of these guys are spread amongst these teams. And we have to be able to give these guys, you know, credit and give them the confidence that we could actually do it. And that was, that's the difficult part. So we worked closely with the engineers. Um, at the end, um, Pure Engineering engineered the, the, you know, the latest four that are in the boats today, which are, is also a, a New Zealand uh, company, New Zealand team. Um, you know, one of the founders, um, um, Giovanni, um, uh, Gio is a, you know, he got huge amounts of respect by everybody. Um, you know, we worked and you know, I even went to New Zealand, sat down and we went through, you know, how we were going to engineer it, how we're going to build it and the right processes. You know, we started with a process early on because we were worried that we, you know, we were concerned anyway that we, we couldn't yeah. build these things with too many steps and too many processes, which can then drive in imperfections, but also produce a really long time frame. Um, that's what we started with. In the end, you know, at the end of the day, we, um, when the final foil arm was engineered, that's when we, you know, we really had to sit down and we came up with a process that was not an easy process. It was actually probably more difficult than the first one, um, but it gave ourselves a lot of uh, confidence to be able to do it. And in the end, we produced, 
you know, I think 18 foil arms in the end that were all identical for everybody. Yeah. Um, and we have had no problems so far. You know, we, we, the, the, the teams have taken their foils, they've put them on the boat and they've gone racing and we haven't seen any problems. Touch wood, you know, today. So that for us is a, a huge achievement to be able to do that with yeah, such a I, big, heavy foil arm um, in such a short time frame. I think it will be a big legacy also for the future. The Brits of uh, uh, Ineos, uh, during the World Series in December, complained about uh, the foil arms or probably the, the system. They also protested with the defender. Uh, uh, what, what did wrong and what... Uh, What, what's happened in December and how did you manage the situation? Yeah, I think I don't really know too much about that, to be honest with you, Fabio. I don't know any more than you. You know, it's been in the publicity and, and uh, you know, the one thing about the America's Cup, which is pretty cool, is, um, you know, there's what happens behind the scenes and what happens sort of in the front and, and on, on the front stage, which we all get to see. And, You know, the protesting and so forth, it's all part of the America's Cup, you know, and it creates, yeah. you know, it creates the story for the future, which are a few more paragraphs in the book. So it's pretty exciting. For sure, they had some problems. I don't think we'll ever know, um, you know, whether it was their own problems or part of the one design system itself, which is the internal system. Um, you know, for us, we're happy it was nothing to do with the arm or anything that we provided. But um, whatever they did, they did a good job to turn it around, you know, whether they did it themselves or they, you know, had some support um, from Team New Zealand and the, and the system itself, the electronics. So I don't really know. But um, for sure, you know, what we all saw was a, a great turnaround of a boat that was a little bit in trouble to a boat that was obviously sailing very fast and did a great job. Okay. Yeah. We are running to the Prada Cup final. Yeah, we have the Luna Rossa Cup. You work also there. for Luna Rossa, so you are uh, a supporter now, no? Talking with Absolutely. a supporter. How will Luna Rossa arrive uh, and get there, get for, to the final, uh, in, in a state of shape, I mean? Uh, um, if you have a scale of 100, uh, what percentage of performance uh, has the team achieved to date, in your opinion? Uh, and also, what at, the, at what point is Ineos and who will win the final? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, my perception of the cup, uh, I tried to do this quickly, but my perception really, really early is um, your results of the America's Cup at the end, uh, in my opinion, come down to the, the first people that you hire and your strategy of the America's Cup that's laid out in the first few months of your program. That's that's in a nutshell, what I think the America's Cup's all about. So I think, um, you know, Luna Rose has done a fantastic job so far. I think it comes down to the, the strategy that uh, Max Adena has put on the table with his key group of players around him, uh, you know, a few years ago when it was laid out. And they're playing out those rules. They're playing out that program today that was set out a few years ago. Um, so that's how you judge, I think, the, the result of your team is how it was planned and how it was laid out in the strategy. Now, we all know that the America's Cup, you never have enough time. It doesn't matter how much money you have, but you never have enough time. And it's how much, you know, it's where you spend that money and what part of the boat and the strategy that's laid out at the beginning. And when you do it, you know, do you do it early? Do you do it late? You know, we've seen boats being put in the water early. We've seen them boats putting put in the in, in, in late. Um, and then the continual evolution of developing your boat. And that program is obviously built along the way as well. And you've seen, you know, we've seen Lunarosa uh, to date, you know, um, have a really good um, regatta in the Christmas regatta and then continue evolving. You know, that boat's just been getting faster and faster. Um, And but so of the other teams and you can see like some teams in the Christmas race had their second evolution of wings. Some had their third, which are their finals and some not. And then, you know, and then there's been a, an evolution of that. Some, you know, changing bits on the sails and the rigs. So and the aerodynamics, you know, with little foils and things coming on and uh, spoilers and cowling going over the cockpits for the men. You know, that to me, is all part of the plan 
uh, sort of, you know, stage one. And then, and we're just seeing how it's playing out today. And I think Luna Rose has done a fantastic job today. Obviously, they're in the final of the of the Prada Cup, which they were in the final of the Louis Vuitton in 2000, and they haven't been there since. So, obviously, hats off. They've done a great job. And I think with the guys on board like Horatio, Carabelli and, and Max and the, the guys leading that team, they've got more things that they'll pull out to implement on the boat and the design and the systems to continue developing that boat and bring in more speed and systems, better VMG, which yeah. we saw in the last races. And they'll continue that all the way through to the America's Cup. I have no doubt. Never stop. So we, we, I, I think we can talk each other, we can call each other from New Zealand uh, in the next uh, weeks and days, and so you can update us on what's happening on the America's Cup scene there. Absolutely. Uh, Viaduct Viadu Basin, Viadu Basin. Absolutely. But, thanks. Very last question for you is, uh, we saw and we understand now that the foiling is everywhere in sailing world. Will they also arrive in the cruising boats? Uh, absolutely, Fabio. There's no doubt in my mind that there'd be a, a trickle-down effect like like every America's Cup and, you know, whether it's a foil, the systems, the electronics, technology will always have a trickle-down. You know, we've seen that trickle-down already into the Persico 69F, which, you know, which is going very successfully for us. And I think, um, you know, foils will end up in the, in the racer cruisers and the cruising boats uh, of the future. Um, absolutely. It's there for speed, it's there because of uh, comfort. There's many, um, you know, secondary advantages to having falls on a boat, but there's no doubt in my mind. And, and even today, we are working on boats that are not involved specifically in racing, but we are developing and designing and working on boats today with, with designers that you'll see in the very short future. 